Hello and welcome to the Monday, September 12th, 2022 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from New York City, New York. One of the goals of analyzing malware can be to find out uh, where, for example, a phishing page or a piece of malware that's being downloaded is hosted in order to either add it to some block list or maybe even take it down so to prevent additional damage being caused by this malicious uh, file. On the other hand, there are attackers that are, of course, uh, then trying to find locations that are hard to take down. But the, what we have this weekend is actually sort of the opposite where an attacker is actively managing uh, the location where the file is hosted in order to sort of keep that URL ephemeral and make it more difficult to actually then, for example, discover related uh, events or also uh, to analyze the additional malware that's being downloaded in this case. He wrote up a Word document that contained a URL that uh, linked uh, to a website that only hosts files for 24 hours and automatically uh, deletes them. QAC.im, also known as QAC.ru. The remainder of the URL is sort of your typical UUID uh, format, so basically just a random uh, string. Now, if you never heard of QAC.im or qac.ru you're not alone the site was new to me too the site also offers uh, ephemeral email addresses and appears to be not very popular uh, the counter for how many messages they sent was around uh, 3000 uh, when i looked at it uh, before starting uh, this uh, recording so by using a site that's relatively unknown the attacker may believe that it's less likely uh, going to be found in block lists uh, that often are blocking uh, file download sites uh, like this. And Noam with a legit security posted a blog post uh, shining a light on a well-known issue with GitHub's protected uh, branches. This feature is uh, included with paid accounts, so you don't get it uh, with the free GitHub account. But the basic function here is that uh, if you would like to merge a pull request with your main or default branch, then a second developer first has to approve that pull request. And the problem here is that, well, uh, these approvals aren't quite sort of atomic enough. Uh, what happens is that a reviewer may review a particular pull request at the same time, a developer then pushes an update to the branch the pull request is based on. And then, of course, a different code is being merged than the code that was actually reviewed. GitHub doesn't consider that a bug. It considers it a feature. That's sort of how it's supposed to work. And, well, that's sort of also how Git kind of works. There is a workaround here how you can make it more secure by actually requiring two pull requests. Now, the blog post here mentions that, of course, an attacker could submit a malicious uh, pull request this way. They, they have to time it uh, quite right. And in my opinion, there's usually uh, some kind of implied trust if you are accepting a uh, pull requests. There are many ways uh, to hide malicious code in a complex pull request. So I'm not sure if that's really sort of the main purpose here of these protected branches to prevent malicious pull requests. The main purpose is really sort of to establish like a minimum quality gate or such to basically basically require a particular uh, review from collaborating uh, developers. And Sentinel Labs is reporting that uh, they're seeing intermittent encryption uh, being used more by ransomware. What this refers to is, in my opinion, maybe better called partial encryption. The goal is to speed the encryption process and to lower the detection probability. The big problem, well, yeah, attackers have problems too, uh, that attackers are trying to overcome here is that encryption takes time. To encrypt all the files on a system can take hours, in some cases days, depends on, of course, disk space, system space, and how many files you're trying uh, to encrypt. 
while the encryption happens, you're running the risk of being discovered before any of the really important files are being uh, encrypted. And with that, of course, you lower the probability of the ransom being paid. What this intermittent encryption refers to is that instead of encrypting the entire file, the attacker will first just encrypt a small part of all files and then basically do a second pass where they then encrypt the next part of the file and so on. Of course, even a partial encrypted file is usually no longer useful. So with that, they cause damage faster. Also, they may lower the probability of being discovered somewhat because a lot of, sort of the more generic ransomware detection schemes are looking at changes in the entropy to files. Once they hit certain thresholds, uh, they basically uh, get active and uh, by only encrypting a part of file, you may not trigger that threshold yet. And one of the side effects of using TLS everywhere these days is the huge number of certificates that have to be created, maintained, and of course rotated. And one aspect of the certificate life cycle is the possible revocation of a certificate before it expires. Now, for example, if a certificate was issued in error, traditionally certificate revocation lists were used to enumerate certificates that should no longer be trusted. But of course, with so many certificates being out there and the uh, sort of authorities like in particular Let's Encrypt uh, managing billions of certificates, I think it is uh, these days, at least uh, many millions of certificates, there's a potential that these certificate revocation lists become kind of unwieldy. And uh, Let's Encrypt has not used certificate revocation lists as a result. Instead, they use the Online Certificate Status Protocol, or OCSP. Now, this is a web service that a certificate authority runs, and you can use it to check if a particular certificate is valid or not, or has never really been issued. So in the last few years, this OCSP has really sort of been taken over uh, from uh, certificate revocation lists. But uh, Let's Encrypt now stated that they're looking back into using certificate revocation lists again. They think they came up with a scheme to make them more scalable. Each one of the certificate revocation lists, and uh, they may have multiple ones, is sharded, as they call it, basically split into 128 different parts that supposedly will make them more scalable. Also, if a certificate is being renewed, it remains with the same shard. So uh, that also makes things a little bit easier. In addition, some of the browsers came up with their own ways to store uh, the certificate revocation lists in a more compressed format, which hopefully will also help them scale. One of the disadvantages of OCSP, the Online Certificate Status Protocol, is that uh, whenever you connect to a website, you potentially will have to also connect to this OCSP web service. Now, there are things like OCSP stapling and such to avoid that, but that's not often done. I know in my own network, a large number of HTTP requests I'm seeing are actually going to OCSP uh, services, uh, not to actual websites. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.